So tell us about the map. So you've, you have written books in the past, um, which have sold very well and been translated into 17 languages? I think, far, I think it was about 17, 18 languages, yeah. Um, and now you're trying to do something very different in, in, from that. And I know it's something you've been working on for a while. So in a sense, it's, it's a second or third phase of something you've been working on for a while. But you're trying to produce or, or create all of the future on a single page. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how on earth you do that. Well, it came. Fr it actually started in Sydney, Australia in, in about 2007 when I was writing a bunch of megatrends as a Word document. And it was just boring and useless because you couldn't connect anything. It didn't seem to come alive. It was just passive. And I got out, I had two kids that were quite small at the time. I got out their felt pens and started doing the scribble essentially and trying to join things together and played around with that. And it seemed to work quite well. And I think it's also my, my father was a physicist, but my mother's an art teacher. I think I, maybe the art bit came through there a little bit. <laughs> um, and I quite like trying to represent things visually and it's it's sort of of its time as well there's too much information so it's a summary of of what's going on is very attractive to people we're moving into a much more visual culture now so that resonates um, it looks vaguely attractive aesthetic so that resonates as well and I like the challenge of it I like trying to get things on a piece of paper so to some extent the new map is a summary of my last book digital versus human with a bunch of other stuff thrown in yeah um, the key thing is is you can play around with the connections on, on a map of some form. Um, and the aim of it really is to just get people to think. But to get people to think, you've got to hit them over the head with a hammer. Um, and that's where the provocation comes from. You know, or the, or the prediction is there to provoke people. So if you talk about things that are going to appear or disappear, you, you tend to engage people quite well, I think, in a conversation. So when you talk about provocation, do you mean you are pushing the boundaries of possibility or do you think you mean you're simply stating what you think is really going to happen in a way that grabs their attention it's, it's both everything on the map i think is credible i mean there are some there are some jokes on it which you find if you look hard enough but even those are credible right um i think again to get a reaction the best reaction you get is when you push things to the very edges to the very extreme and i think funny enough though one of the reasons we're in a bit of a mess at the moment one of the reasons we're shocked by trump and brexit is, is that classic thing of we think the future is just a sort of simplistic logical extension of the present without any sort of mess or complexity. Yeah. We, we, we project from recent personal past experience and that's what gets us into trouble. And to be better at getting the future right, you have got to separate what's probable from what's plausible from what's pro possible. I mean, there's a, there's a Sherlock Holmes quote, which from memory is, you've got to start by removing what's impossible and whatever remains, no matter how improbable, should be considered possible. Yeah. Um, that's, that's quite a good way of thinking about it. So, you know, it was always possible we we're going to vote to leave Europe. But equally, once we'd voted to go, it was always possible that we might not end up going. Um, you know, there's, we should stop using will and won't and thinking in terms of absolute certainty and impossible possible the whole time. It's, it's, it's complex and nuanced and grey. And well, I, I'm interested in hearing about jokes because I understand it. one of the jokes on a previous version of the map was that um, Donald Trump would become president. Well, the map took about two years to finish, and, and I did about 22 versions drawn by hand. And on most of the early versions, until about 18 months ago, under global risks, I had, most of which, incidentally, are quite negative, I had Donald Trump really is president underneath decline of human intelligence, which is a wonderful piece of serendipity. Um, and then, of course, he was, so I had to take it off and come up with another risk. Um, and you know, a few of those sort of things have happened. So do you think there's a role for making more jokes about the future just because they allow us to indulge in scenarios that actually might turn out to be true? I, th I think one of the reasons people are drawn to the map, apart from you know, what's that, that looks interesting, what's on it, is it has a sense of humour and it doesn't take itself too seriously. Um, I mean, if you look at, I mean, all the other stuff, you know, Ernst & Young, McKinsey, Department of Defence, it's, it's all inherently deadly serious. And I think to some extent, if, it, if, it, if it's got a little bit of humour in there, it pulls people in. And you know, at the end of the day, you can't be certain about any of this stuff. So mm. that's an acknowledgement of that to some extent. And you can have fun with it. Yeah. Hot topic du jour is, is AI. How might the map and the intersections help me understand how to think about and frame AI and the future of that for my business, for instance? It, it won't explain it but it'll it'll start the conversation um i mean funnily enough that that's more or less the entire subject matter of this this book i wrote um digital versus human but if you look at a combination of the technology line and the society line particularly in the top left hand corner 
you can see where I think that's going. And, and essentially, unless we decide to stop this, which we might, um, the two things are going to merge. You know, we're going to be, well, we're already becoming much more like machines. Machines are becoming much more like us. Um, the, there's some stuff on there which sounds like a joke, but it's not. I mean, people having stronger relationships with machines and other human beings is kind of happening already, more or less. Um, people having sex with robots is kind of happening in weird places already. Um, give it 50 years, that could get really quite extreme. Mm. I, I think it's just going to all intensify, and you're not, they're just going to merge between themselves, and you're not going to be able to tell the difference half the time. But w where it's... I mean, the, the good news is there, there are a few things that humans can do that even the most sophisticated AI can't, and some people question that, but I, I just... Uh, creativity and empathy. I mean, machines can't be moral. Um, I think they're very bad at creativity. They're very good at copying. They'll do you a nice Rembrandt. They'll do you an, a, a, an original Rem, you know, painting in the style of Rembrandt that can fool an expert, but they can't invent cubism. Mm -hmm. they, they fundamentally can't invent. Um, they're not very empathetic. They're not very inspiring leaders. Um, they probably are quite intuitive, actually. That's the bad news. Um, and I think we, we will continue to have a lot of social needs. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're, we need physical interaction with other human beings, I think. Some people dispute that, but I, I think we do. So there's still a role for human beings. But you know, if your job consists of sort of inputting stuff into a screen or, or a computer or staring at a screen all day, you, you possibly want to look at and getting a new career, actually. <laughs> um, I mean, there are, they, you know, we've got effective computing, I think, somewhere on the map. Machines that can judge the emotional state of a user and adjust themselves accordingly. Machines that can fool us um, into thinking they're, they're actually human, which goes back to the whole Turing thing. Um, you know, we've got soft, we've already got software that can write software. Um, so I think this idea, and it's, it's been widely discussed, of a sort of lifelong personal assistant that's, that's smarter than any human on the planet is not too far away. Okay. Um, and I think we can make them quite personable, potentially as well. They can have quite a character, they could be quite quirky, we could, we could personalise them according to our wishes, and that would be very, very attractive to people. Mm -hmm. Uh, clearly, you know, a lot of our work is with brands and brand owners. How, how might your map be most useful for a brand owner? Well, uh, essentially, it's a map of current, emerging, future risks and opportunities. And you know, I think any risk is also an opportunity and, and, and vice versa. And it's really just a map of, of the external operating environment. And if you're trying to have a brand that remains relevant, um, just test it against some of the stuff on, on this map. Um, and what if, you know, what if the written word entirely disappeared? Mm -hmm. um, we became totally um, reliant on, on, on visual communication, which is actually, I don't think that's quite on the map, it, it slightly is. You know, how, how would you respond to that? How would you respond to a demographic which has no attention span whatsoever or is incredibly promiscuous yep. um, or prefers the company of machines to people? How would you, as a retailer, for example, respond to that? Mm. So it's, it, again, it's, it's there to just sort of poke you and say, you know, what if, what if, what if?